Mum was sick in hospital when I was seven. And I was standing here with my gran and there was some people coming from Melbourne to take me to help for a holiday. And they came and I was very scared because the lady, um, we didn't see many strangers because we just had this little isolated community back in 68. Not even everybody had a car and nobody had a phone. And I didn't want to go with these people, but I had no say. Other families took my brothers. And I went to Melbourne with these people and um, the first night I was there, the abuse started and I didn't say anything, so. had died at the end of 2008 and the judges said well you know she said she was protecting her mother why didn't she go to the police when her mother died well I'm happy in any forum to explain my actions or my inactions because that's just victim blaming that's got nothing to do with anything where's the template to say if you follow this formula you're going to get some sort of justice for child rape because it doesn't exist. Well, I'm an honest fella. Like, if it didn't happen, I'd say it didn't happen. If it's all rosy, I'd say it's all rosy. It's not all rosy. This thing is just vibrating in her head, like thump, 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 thump. If we go to have a conversation like this, there's just this little bit of room in there for that. It's very shallow. It's very shallow. And it's been that way, but I can understand because all this stuff is just documented in her head. So I'm not going to gloss over it. Oh, I want you to get it out. Mm. I, want you, I need you to get it out. Prior to us getting married, you'd, you'd felt that, you know, you had something to tell me and you, you told me that the, the fact that you'd been raped, that you needed to tell me so as there'd be a clean slate for, for us to start our life together. Well, to me, I felt, thought that that was a horrible thing to have happened but it didn't make any difference to me as to, for my love towards Marita or to ascertain whether I would go ahead and marry her or not. I just felt very sorry for her that it had happened in her life, but once she told me, we just put it behind us, really, and it was never talked about again. And it never seemed to have any influence on our, on our married life at all, I didn't think. But it wasn't until Marita's mother died, she started on this journey that she wanted to act on what had happened. She contacted the police and I'd say myself that subconsciously when her mother was alive that she had been able to live with what had happened to her, knowing that if she had have proceeded with anything while her mother was alive, it would have been a burden for her mother for, uh, she would have made her mother feel like she had failed her. But the moment Mrs Elliot w had died, she wanted to just get justice for what had happened to her. So anyway, that's the journey. It's been probably the ruination of a marriage, really, even though we still, still live together and the children are still here. The um, harmoniousness of a family has been completely uh, turned into disarray because virtually every day, because Marita's had to push this herself and document things and contact people and do it herself, probably her head is 85 to 90% full of her case. And we haven't suffered, we've eaten well and we've lived well, but emotionally it's been... Um, it's very uh, unfair. It's been a very um, draining situation and I cannot see it changing until we get conclusion to it. 
and um, I support Marita 100%, even though it's been there been unhappy times. I know what it would feel like to just say, oh, geez, this is too hard. That's what they want you to do. Uh, we spent too much money. Uh, we feel sick. There's too much turmoil. There's too much unhappiness. It's not in Marita. So, 1st of July, 1968, Dad died. And um, I can remember that extremely clearly. I can remember the events of the day and the events of his funeral and the realisation that uh, our family was now different to every family in the town that had large families, often larger than ours, but functioning families in the fact that they had a mother and a father. And the thing with child sexual abuse that you realise now is that uh, a vulnerable child is a target. And I was just about to become that vulnerable child. In the summer of 1968, Mum had a hysterectomy. Various people who knew Mum stepped in at this point to take children away to help because Mum wasn't home and I was there with Gran at 84 years of age and me being seven. When the lady came and she got out of the car, I can remember standing there with Gran and having a, a feeling of apprehensiveness and not being comfortable and I know now that she got instinct because out of that car got three youths with the woman. So there was two boys which I know now were her sons and another youth who was an Aboriginal. I'd never met an Aboriginal before and. I can remember feeling, feeling very uneasy and uh, pushing into grand skirts and really not wanting to go, but I, I, I was a child back in those days. Children were seen and not heard. This needed to be done. These people had come from Melbourne to pick me up to help, so I went with them. So after a big trip with these people, we arrived at the house so the lady put me into bed the first night and I was in a room on my own, which is the same as what it was at home, so that wasn't very scary. And very excitingly, there was a radio in the room and I thought, wow, this is pretty, this is pretty, uh, <laughs> this is pretty um, special. And uh, the radio was on and she said, you turn off that radio before you go to sleep. And she turned off the light and left me in the room alone. And uh, at some point after that, Suddenly there was a hand across my mouth and uh, I'm going to say I was terrified because I'm sure I would have been terrified because I was only seven and this was my first time away from the family unit. And it was the Aboriginal youth who I know a lot about now but I didn't then. I was very scared. Um, he sexually abused me. I can't even go into details. It is a long time ago and the courts are going to use that against me but the Aborigine came into my room and he started sexually uh, molesting me and he told me not to say anything or I would get into trouble. In the morning when I woke up, the woman came in and I know who she was now, her name was Mrs. And she went cross at me because the radio was on and I was just scared. I didn't know these people. I didn't tell her, I'd been threatened, I'd been sexually abused and the first night I was um, probably like a stunned mullet or a stunned rabbit. I just don't know what I did, I didn't do anything. And she gave us breakfast and sent us outside to play and she sent us outside every day. Now, I did think maybe this woman didn't know about the ways of boys. I've since found out that she had daughters herself but none of those girls were there. There was only the three boys in the school holidays of the summer 1968. And I can say to you now today that and were very busy with the business of being horny 14 year old boys and I was to be their girl in a week to 10 days of unprotected sex. The pinnacle of the abuse was the mother 
He sent us to the beach and they had three bikes, so I was put on the back of a bike and I loved the beach and I loved water and I loved swimming, but they didn't have the beach on their mind. So they ditched that plan and took me under an overpass, a bridge, and uh, they posted as a lookout because they knew what they were doing was wrong. They knew what they were going to do was wrong and first and then um, removed my clothing and they raped me. They threatened me, they said that I wasn't to tell. Every night we sat down to have dinner, the father would come home, his name was Children in those days, you were small, you were seen but not heard, you had to have manners. There's a hierarchy and you're at the bottom, right at the bottom. So I don't know what prompted me, but I spoke at the table and because they've lied, we'll never ever really be able to uh, have the proper sequence of what happened. But uh, when I spoke, I was promptly and immediately removed from the home. So the adults knew and Mum got me back with the message that what had happened that I'd been uh, interfered with and I'm sure no mother of any daughter would ever want to get a daughter back with the message of uh, accompanied me when I went back to her. So Mum said to me that we wouldn't talk about it and we didn't talk about it. I went back to uh, pretending a loud mouth that uh, has this big secret that doesn't talk about it. So I can sort of look back now and say the behavioural problems, the alteration in personality, the aggressiveness, the anger, all started from that point. I became a problem child, I became a problem to mum and I, I had this sense of power that I have something over you mum, I've got something that I can hold over you and as I got older I just got angrier. As Victims will tell you this is quite normal behaviour, but looking back now, it's not very normal. And I had uh, these rages that were just unbefitting to a small child, a small girl, and I would just go off the planet. My mum had very clear boundaries and she enforced them. I can remember her sending me to my room on a couple of occasions for behaviour that wasn't acceptable. So in my room they had a box of boxes and the box of boxes was box of boxes of jigsaws because we didn't have a TV so if it was raining and the school holidays were on someone might be doing a 5,000 piece jigsaw and uh, my concentration had gone so I didn't do anything like that. So she put me in my room and I was really angry and I saw the box of jigsaws up high and I thought I reckon I could reach that if I tried hard enough and I got it down and I thought what would really really do this family's head in is if I tipped a jigsaw out but I didn't just tip one out I tipped them all out and I couldn't see my floor in my bedroom and as I was doing it I just thought I'm gonna die they're gonna kill me not just mum they're all gonna kill me I would have been eight and nine and uh, sobbing and being upset and being angry and sobbing and sobbing until you think that you're just going to break just coming from the depth of your being as you're growing up not coping well with school, not coping well socially. It got to the point where uh, I got to grade six across the road and things weren't good and there was a nun there and mum went over and she said she begged them to keep me back in grade six because I was a bit young, I was having uh, all sorts of personal behaviour issues and she thought that if they held me back in grade six that might help me before I went to secondary school. They said no way did they want me for another year. Not, not on your Nelly, wouldn't entertain it for a minute. We just want her out of here. So she was faced then with where do I go to school at 11. Um, so Scion College in Warrigal beaconed because that was where both mum and my sister had been and they'd been boarders. But that facility no longer existed. So to attend Scion College in Warrigal, I would have to travel. And that's what I did. I caught the bus as an 11 year old at seven o'clock in the morning, took a bus and then a train and then walked quite a long distance to Sion College where the new teacher, her first year of teaching had the year sevens and she cried every day, that teacher. She was just sport for me and uh, that wasn't sustainable, either me being there or me traveling such a distance 
at 11, so I only lasted for a year and then I went to Pakenham High. When I started at Pakenham High, we were going to the pool this particular day and a lovely young man walked beside me all the way from the high school to the pool and back, which is quite a distance. He made it quite plain that he fancied me. Internally, I was concerned that boys were starting to take an interest in me and I decided to get a skinhead. I thought that might help if I got rid of my blonde hair. I know now as an adult and a mature woman that what had happened to me over the course of that week of unprotected sex at seven was now impacting me as I'm trying to get an education. So I left school completely. We're here at the Burrumbeek Turf Club with this little bear. This bear is for abused, disadvantaged. So this little bear I certainly could have done with age seven and eight in trying to uh, recover from sexual abuse. And um, so because the justice system doesn't work, we're pushed to tying ribbons on a fence to call it a loud fence to say, there should be no more silence around child sexual abuse. So I'm the self-appointed high priestess of the Loud Fence in Ballarat, done by my friend and mentor, creative director, Erin McCluskey. So I thank her for that. I think it's really important when we're talking about child sexual assault to Sometimes I think it's important to refocus back to the age when this happened and for viewers and people we speak to to understand we're advocating for these children that we were. So I thought it's important just to take the visuals and to see these little strawberry shortcake dolls here. They were my life at age seven when I was abused. I love playing with my strawberry shortcake dolls. I probably played with them till I was about 12. I don't know, <laughs> backwards or something. I love my dolls. And, um, and then I had my ballet slippers. I love ballet and um, I stopped ballet because of my perpetrator to stop the abuse and me coming into contact with him. I stopped ballet. So um, Marita, you know, you were age seven as well in your abuse. And it's a very common age that the the junior primary school years is when a lot of survivors are targeted by perpetrators. So a lot of us go through primary school carrying this baggage all the way through our lives. Because I left school at 12, I didn't have a lot of career options. Brian Courtney was a racehorse trainer based at Caulfield and he'd been uh, Victoria's leading trainer from 1960 to 63. He said, yes, she can have a job with me. So at 15, I went to the racing stables at Caulfield. And uh, if you're ever going to send your daughter somewhere, it'd probably be the last place that you would, would send her and her be safe. But prior, uh, forewarned is forearmed. So I had a, a, a pretty good sense of keeping myself safe. It was a pretty dodgy place to be. There's no doubt about it. I don't think I would have uh, touched drugs, but I did drink alcohol and I did walk on the road there. I went to parties and uh, I wasn't in a very safe place, but um, I made myself safe and I made some good friends and uh, those friends remain today. After years of being a, a daughter and a sister and a wife and a mother, I suddenly kind of thought it's time for me. And uh, one of the first things that menopausal women will notice is a disruption in sleep. I hadn't been sleeping very well and I would make to-do lists in my head at night and suddenly up on my to-do list pop, go to the police. That's a bit of a random thought. So 2012, I rang the police here in Ballarat to find to my enormous horror that I couldn't speak. 
And that was pretty embarrassing uh, for someone who likes to talk a lot. And the policeman said to me, lady, I don't know what happened to you, but you need counselling. So 2013, I got in and I made a police report. It was just myself and senior detective Matthew Young in of the socket. And uh, even the procedures, although they've, they're better now, I was kind of still surprised that I only spoke to one policeman. And he said three things. He said, I believe you. Oh, do you? That's very nice. Um, you need counselling. Do I? Uh, it turns out I was pretty angry. And three, you need to make a vo you need to lodge a vocat claim. And I said, what's that? And he said, it's a victim of crime claim. And uh, I said, is that funded by the taxpayer? And he said that it was. And I said, well, I don't need it, thank you, I'm fine. I think the poor old taxpayer's got enough on his plate. So I'm fine, thank you, I don't need it. At that point, looking back now, you can think, gosh, that's really strange. You can go in there and report a rape or multiple rapes, and including gang rape, and they don't mention justice anywhere. He took it seriously and uh, he started to work on it and we didn't get very far. We don't, as a victim, have what the defendant has. The defendant has a legal team and their own lawyer that is bound to act on their instructions. They are given advice and they are bound to act. The police, they do not represent the victim. And I think most people in society, actually I know it for a fact, most people think that that is what happens. The victim has the police and the defendant has a legal team. That is not what happens. That police prosecutor is not the mouthpiece of the victim. They're not the mouthpiece of the victim. If they're saying something you don't like, you can't sit behind them as the victim and tap them on the shoulder and say, no, you forgot this bit, say this bit. Oh my God, I'm not gonna pay you. Sh shut up, say that bit. You've got to ask him that. That's what defendants do. You'll see them constantly tap on their barrister and their uh, lawyer's shoulders. In a courtroom, the victim isn't even there. It, only if and unless they are called into the witness box. There's no place for the victim to sit. To sit. There's no spot on the bar table. There's no um, lawyer that they can quickly ask a question and say what, what about this bit what about that that isn't how it works the prosecutor is simply there to press charges and the prosecutor will do that by picking and choosing cherry picking which victims end up being important or can be used for that criminal case to to prove those charges and this is a huge problem in the criminal justice system in fact 99 percent of survivors that tell police end up on the scrap heap it's patronizing we are treated yes. as children we're treated as legal non-entities and that is because we are we don't have any legal standing in a criminal matter and that just that has to stop so we're all on this pursuit of justice trip that costs us our jobs our family, social ostracisation, our children's lives are affected. We all fall apart. Pressure on marriages. Oh, my God. You know, my husband's been dealing with a raving harpy for seven years. Me? And I was sitting in the foyer waiting and they came in like two naughty schoolboys, but they're both bigger than me, big men powerful men, entitled men, wealthy men, whenever wrong men, those type of men. And uh, the lawyer put his hand out and shook my hand and I shook his hand and then he stepped back and there's my perpetrator. We meet again. And uh, he stepped forward and put out his hand and I just put my hands behind my back and I said, don't you touch me. So we went in and had a meeting and um, big boardroom and the lawyer sat at the head of the table and my perpetrator sat across the table and I just felt incredibly calm and I'd waited for so long for this moment. At, towards the end of the hour, he got up and he put his hands on the table. He had the phone, his phone on the table in front of him and I had my phone in my pocket turned off out of respect. And he put his hands on the table and he leaned across the table to me and he said, do you know who I am? And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, you've obviously got a license to rape and plunder at will. The laws of the land don't apply to you and stupid me doesn't know this. I mean, what is that supposed to mean? Do you know who I am? I'm so entitled, I can do what I like. No, the laws of the land don't actually work like that. As he started to sit back down, 
I thought, yes, I do know who you are because you're so stupid you've been telling me and I know for sure that... You know, I said, so I said, yes, I know who you are now. I said, I know 100% sure you're the man who raped me when I was a little girl. And with that, he picked up, he got, he picked, he picked up his phone and he stormed out of the room. Goodbye. So his lawyer's there and I stood up and his lawyer stood up and his lawyer's bigger than me and stronger than me and he stood over me and he poked me, he didn't touch me and he said, we are going to break you, we are going to drag you all the way to the Supreme Court. And I'm like really comfortable with that, don't have a problem with that at all, be more than happy to go to the Supreme Court. Marita was one of the first cases that went through the county court uh, suing her perpetrator for what happened many, many years before. And it was exactly that. The judge said it's too long ago for the defendant to fairly defend your accusations Thank against God. him. So for the privilege, as Marita says, I quote, of not being heard, she had to pay her perpetrator over $100,000 and she was not heard, the case was not heard, the evidence wasn't given, um, the evidence wasn't tested. So on the one hand, we've got the media and the law, you know, patting itself on the back to say, look what we've done, we understand survivors so much. Um, obviously, you know, it thinks, great, we've opened the floodgates, Marita was able to make her application, she went to the law firm and the happy little lawyers took her money and prepared all her expensive legal documents and she went to the court and the statute of limitations, frankly, it still operates because if the very passage of time that the statute of limitations being abolished got rid of, that passage of time that used to knock complainants out, that same passage of time is then used against Marita to say, well, hold on, it's too long ago for him to fairly defend the action. So on paper, it looks like we've made this major advance for survivors out there to be coming to the courts and making all these applications. But when they get in there, the reality is that same passage of time is gonna kick them up the bottom. So in America, in all the different states now, they're agitating to get the statute of limitations changed. And I'm like, be very careful what you wish for. They changed here in 2015. Nothing's changed. They're still not going to let you into court. How does a seven-year-old gather evidence? How does a seven-year-old stand up for herself? Am I a dirty, rotten liar? No, I'm not. Do I want to be heard? Yes, I do. Am I frightened? Not really. What's he going to sue me for? Telling the truth? I have um, absolute proof of an over 40 year relationship between the two families. My perpetrator's namesake uncle was a Catholic priest. He'd instructed mum into the Catholic faith and baptised her. She was a convert. He married mum and dad at St Augustine's Church in Burke Street, Melbourne on the 31st of the 5th, 1949. He baptised my eldest sister when she was born. He travelled to Kyneton to baptise my brother Jared. He wrote to mum on the death of her mother, who was a non-Catholic. And it was because of this ongoing relationship that I was sent to his brother's house when mum was sick. I understand why Marita's doing this documentary. It's not hard to work out. When a survivor comes forward, the first thing they do is report to police. And that's exactly what Marita did. She reported to police. And then when you don't get traction for your complaint in the criminal justice system, so in Marita's case, the police were interested, they were hot and cold one minute to the next. First they were interested, then they weren't. Then it sort of, it all went cold. Then they ring her and they get her hope up again. And then something else is happening. They're, they're investigating again, or there's a new investigator. And so you think, oh great, then in the end, after many years of hot and cold, yep. it just went to nothing. Yep. So that's, and they don't even tell you. They don't tell you. You're ringing like a you. psycho, ringing up mm. and think, I remember getting calls from Marita saying, should I ring them again? Like, you know, and, and many clients, should I ring them again? Oh, will they find me annoying? And this is the thing. When you don't get traction in the criminal justice system, who ever thinks about what happens to the survivor then? Like... That energy and expectation has to flow somewhere. It's like a dam. If you build a dam wall and eventually it bursts, that water's still there. It's a mass that exists. And that 
energy and expectation and hope is still got to flow somewhere. So forever, survivors like Marita and I are trying to find another forum to be heard, to be acknowledged, to be validated, to get justice through even, even if it's sort of some morphed idea of justice because you can't get it in the criminal justice system, we're still existing. We still live through that childhood lens of child sexual abuse and we're trying to advocate to other people so they don't have to walk in our same shitty footsteps. And so I speak sometimes with my survivor hat on and sometimes with my lawyer hat on. And I've been a lawyer for 20 years. And Marita, as individual and gorgeous and passionate as you are, I have got many files where if I scrub the name off and put the next name on, it's the same experience of the criminal justice system. It's taken seven years of my life and I've got absolutely nowhere. And I just think if that's my result and I'm a lawyer and my husband's a criminal defence lawyer that deals with these perpetrators or alleged perpetrators, I should say, because only 1% are a perpetrator. So all these alleged perpetrators, we've all got so much time on our hands, we're making up all these crazy allegations against people. Um, if I know all this and we know all the tricks in the book and John and I together, we couldn't get the system to work for me. I'm telling you, it's Marita is a, yes, she's the poster child of, of what happens. But look at what the law has advertised itself. It said we got rid of the Alice defence, which means now the church is a legal entity. You can sue it, right? That's heralded as a major coup. But the thing is, most abuse is familial. It doesn't have the institutional link. And so most perpetrators, there's no point suing them. You'd have a Pyrrhic victory even if you won because there's no money because they're just an everyday Joe. And there's no, so there's no point, you know, in going through that civil justice system. Criminal justice, you already, there's no point because it's a 1% conviction rate. So it'll just embolden them and you'll lose your family and friends. So there's no point doing that as a victim. Um, so again, then they said, the Royal Commission said, let's abolish the statute of limitations. And the government did that and introduced new legislation to do so. But again, we've discussed Marita's case. There is no point in bringing an application for that because that same long passage of time is used as a legal argument as to why the defence, so Marita's alleged perpetrator, could not fairly defend her allegations because it's so long ago. So I think we should take away that advertisement about the statute of limitations being abolished. We should stop and say, look, the floodgate is open, but really all that's going to happen is you're going to be battered over the head with your expensive legal documents when the case is chucked out and you have to pay your perpetrators legal costs that's the reality for survivors for the civil court Here we are in Mum's kitchen, and we can do whatever we like because Mum's actually not here. We'll be 10 years in December. I had a meeting that this lawyer called and I went alone. So what do I do after that meeting to prove that I'm telling the truth and I am truthful? I rang my five brothers who at that point, um, I didn't know if they knew, if they had prior knowledge, all that had happened up to that point was I'd made a statement to the police. My husband Gary had given the police a statement because he had prior knowledge before we were married. And my sister Miriam, who lives in Perth, the oldest of the family, she had also made a statement to the police when the police went to interview about this matter. So when I rang my brothers, all five of them, one, one Friday afternoon, our oldest brother Bernard is 10 years older than me and he was not here in my formative years because he had been away at boarding school at Rupertswood, did we say Rupert? Yes. Salesian College? Salesian College, Sunbury. Um, so both Louis and Bernard knew and they were happy to provide statutory declarations and Bernard can't be here today, but I'll just read it because in typical Bernard fashion, it's pretty blunt, it just says, I, Bernard Joseph Elliott, 
do solemnly and sincerely declare that my mother confided to me as the oldest son that my sister Marita was raped. This happened after the death of my father, who died on the 1st of the 1st, 68, while I was studying engineering at Melbourne University and residing at Newman College. And that has been uh, witnessed by the police in Pakenham in the state of Victoria. So would you like to just <coughs> recall, Louis, what, what you were happy to write and provide me with once I spoke to you about me making a police statement in 2014? Um, this here is a, um, a document that I um, put together after my sister contacted me in the UK where I've been living. I wish to confirm certain facts pertaining to my sister Marita told to me <clears throat> by her mother in the early 70s. Because of the allegations, my mother insisted I tell nobody a promise I have honoured until now when Marita asked me if I knew what had happened to her as a child. Um, I gathered Marita was referring to the molestation she experienced while staying with the family around the time of our father's death. My understanding is that Marita was sexually abused by and two other boys during this period. Mother did not go into any more detail. I have been asked by Marita to declare my awareness of these facts and will have this declaration certified by a practicing member of the Law Society which makes this a legal document. Yours faithfully, Louis or LG Elliot. 27, 2015. Well, I've read the statement that I made again and I don't have any problems with any of it. So I've known about this since approximately the age of 15 after Dad died. With the knowledge I have now, we're actively telling people probably don't report because it just creates jobs for the boys. You don't actually get any justice. The only justice that would have helped me was when I was very young, if there had been some repercussions from those boys, if they had a, if they had been made to write me a letter of apology and I had had access to that letter, every time I felt really bad, I could have opened that letter and read that they were sorry for what they did to me and I probably would have coped. I just think as a lawyer, it helps to use a chessboard to start thinking about the victim. Who is actually the victim on this board? Could it be the Queen? because they're most powerful? The answer is they're not the queen. Let's try again. Are they the king? Are they the protected one that everyone's ensuring is okay and that nothing happens to them? No, they're not the king. Let's just cut to the chase. I know most of you are thinking, maybe they're one of the pawns. Because they're powerless, you'd be wrong again. They're not even a pawn. The answer is the victim is not even in this game of chess. They are not on the board. No one on the board represents the victim either, not legally or emotionally. There's no one on the chessboard for the victim. The victim is not told the rules of the game. So in other words, no legal knowledge, no legal advice, no legal information, no lawyer for them. So they're not told the rules of the game. They don't have a position on the board. How could they win? How can they win if they're not even a player in the game of chess <laughs> and they don't win? Oh, well, sorry, they win 1% of the time. 1% of the time, the victim gets a conviction against their perpetrator. The 1% conviction rate out of all of this criminal justice industry, all this industry, all these stages, all these barristers and legal advisers and police prosecutors and OPP solicitors, all of this industry, all these people busy every day filling up the Supreme Court and the County Court, all about Maritas and Ingrids, all about our allegations that end up being chucked out 99% of the time. So this is just why I call it the criminal injustice system and why I say right back down here, teaching people through the media and through schools and friends and, and networks to tell police is the worst thing you could tell to a survivor. They should definitely tell, but they should tell people in the health industry. They will believe you in the health industry and they will get you the help that you need to go back through the trauma 
and piece it all together. If you're looking for debt validation, look for it from health professionals, your psychologists, your psychiatrists, your counsellors, your, your GPs. That is where to get the validation. Do not seek legal validation, justice, acknowledgement from the criminal justice system. Please don't do it because you will not get it. If you're raped, how can you ever be unraped? My childhood was over at seven. It wouldn't matter how much money someone gave me now, I can't go and buy a new childhood. I can't go and buy good mental health for my mother, who later on, when our son had a mental health breakdown at 18, mum said to me, this happened to me. I just was shaking all the time. And she said, I was hospitalised and away from you children. And she said, they said, eventually you'll get better. And eventually she said, I did get better. And she came back and she was a really good mum in that she was strong. Um, everyone had some issues with her because she was so unbending. Her rules were enforced. We got our mouths washed out with soap. We got, you had to go to mass. You weren't allowed to go on the dole. You had to work. You had to be honest. We weren't allowed to tell lies. Rah, rah, rah. No sex before marriage. Pure. Just... <laughs> she raised seven good citizens and um, my six siblings all support me and that's a really lovely thing because you're not sure when you come out and you go public and you talk about it. I wasn't really sure what my brothers would be like and actually they were very beautiful because I didn't know whether they'd dismiss it and say, oh, it was a long time ago. It's so condescending to say that to people. It happened. Oh, why don't you just get over it? If I could have got over it by now, I would have. <clears throat> rape is a serious crime it's second in severity to murder and if you're murdered you're dead you don't have to live with it if you're raped you have to live with it children need to be protected and the law's not doing enough the system doesn't work so I've challenged the system I'm not very happy with it and because the system wouldn't help me, I'm now having to do things myself. But that's okay. Because if we're successful, we can highlight all the inadequacies. So here we are in Collingwood. We're going to find Eugene, one of my perpetrators when I was gang raped. When Eugene was young, his life was obviously in turmoil because he escaped in 1968 from not one, but two remand centres. So let's hope we find him, guys. And I can have another talk to him. I've already been to meet with, meet with Eugene and he said, uh, lady, you need your money back. And he signed a bit of a confession of sorts. So I've been here before, I know Richmond pretty well and I know Carlton pretty well, but I didn't know Collingwood very well. But I'm making myself comfortable. That's what I like to do, make myself comfortable. There he is, drink, hanging out with his mates. Hi Eugene. Going, Good. I was wondering if I'd be able to talk to you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No worries. Do you remember me? Yep. Good. I've done this for you. I haven't been able to get any of my money back. All right. But I've got this for you. Yep. Can you have a read of it? Yep. It's yeah. yours to yeah. keep. Walk yeah, back. come for a walk. Can we go this way? Oh, Can we go this way? But without your help, I'm stuck. I can't do anything. Do you remember? He's a pig. He's a liar. Yeah. You've showed more class than I 
I don't want you to have any trouble. I will defend you to the hilt if you will help me. I can't do it without you. Do you remember when the police first arrested you? No. Do you do, did you remember me as a kid? The police didn't arrest you about what happened in 1968. Oh, okay. So they come and interview you. Yeah. Would you sit? Would you consent to be on camera with me talking to you? About what? About this matter of me trying to take to court. I can't force you to do anything, but if you help me, I can get my money back through the redress scheme at least, and I can show the. Look, the police flew to WA and interviewed. And he said you were there at their house. I can't produce you and put you there if you don't exist, Eugene. I was seven. I don't want you to get into any trouble. You can be, you can be, if I forgive you and you can be, you can, you say you don't remember, you've had a brain injury, tell them that. Come round the corner and tell them that. You've had a hard life, Eugene. I know you've had a hard life because I've read and studied Uncle Eugene, okay. Yogi. <laughs> and lots of people that you know, I know, and they're saying to me, how are you getting on? And I can say to them, Eugene's been great. I really thank you. So going back, I found that my grandfather and my namesake, M. Elliot, had been the manager of Tirana. I didn't know that. I never met my I grandfather. Didn't know that. <laughs> yeah? So you spent some time in Tirana? I spent a lot of time in Tirana. Why? Was it family disintegration? No, it was uh, stolen gen. Stolen generations. Yeah. And you originated from, like, you're not from Framington or? No, it's Lake Honda. Lake Honda. Same area. Same area, yeah. Same region, not the same area. So when you escaped from. Um, Two remand centres in 1968. Did you go and um, stay at a white person's place in the Pean Highway, Elstonwick? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Anyway, the two brothers there. Apparently she had four daughters. I said that she had six, but she had four daughters. There was no daughters in the house at that time. I think there was. Okay. And could you explain about your acquired brain injury so that, you know... Oh, it's just over the years. I'm um, just deteriorated. I've been very careful with my money and our money and worked hard and I want to get my money back. So would you support me into the redress scheme, Eugene? Yeah. You think I'm a credible person? Well, I bet you few times, so I think you're pretty cred uh, credible. Thank you, and, and have I threatened you, Eugene? No. No. Well, I hold you in very high regard for what you've done, and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, well. Thank you. Yeah. So, as of today, we've met and talked to Eugene, who's shown great bravery and class. I haven't asked him to admit um, to any sexual abuse, which those allegations were made in my original police statement. I don't think I need to do that. I don't need to make him feel vulnerable. He's already marginalised in society and with his health. I just want to highlight the fact that the white man's law only works for white man and uh, people in this case have lied and yet I'm the one that's out of pocket apart from being uh, sexually abused so here I am in Victoria and I say where you can get raped and robbed and it's all legal. I have no criminal history, I have no one with a criminal past supporting me and yet two out of the three people whose names I took to the police have criminal records and yet they're believed over me. So it's nearly 50 years. Well, 
sure, that's a long time, and witnesses might have trouble remembering, but I haven't forgotten, and I still have a sense of outrage and injustice as strong today, perhaps aided by the fact that I'm a mother myself. What mother would want to get her seven-year-old daughter back with the message that she'd been uh, interfered with? I certainly wouldn't want to, and that's why, even though my husband says it didn't impact on our marriage, well, how do you explain the fact that none of our four children ever went on a sleepover, a school camp, kindergarten or daycare? I was terrified that something would happen to my children if I wasn't there to protect them, like what happened to me when my mum was ill in hospital. Thank you.